What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 178. We are back this week. First of all, before we get started, we wanted to apologize for not being able to upload an episode last week. We were all very bummed about that, and we tried our best. However, we've had a lot of technical glitches in the office or in the studio, things that just don't really make sense, audio that's unsalvageable. So we did record last week's episode, but we weren't able to save it after many attempts. It's so, a, it's the wor- it's the worst feeling for us when it we is. like we truly sit feel down. Bad. We're prepared. We're ready to do an episode for you, and then literally something happens unexpected and, mm-hmm. and really out of our control at this point. Uh, but you know, we got we got it figured out this yeah. week, and just Mercury retrograde just <laughs> just in general has been. It's been a lot. An absolute bitch this time around. Let us know if you guys are experiencing that too, because we've just had a lot of, I feel like we're constantly putting out fires. Yeah, we're joking. We're like, we might as well just call ourselves firefighters now. Yeah, we're MHFD. (laughs) The Maha Fire Department. Oh boy. Just putting out fires everywhere we go, it seems like. But it really does suck. We love to, you know, upload as much as we can for you guys. And we hate missing a week, especially when we spend our time recording it. The episode was good. We were happy with it. Um, But there's only so much we can do. And since we do so many different shows and a YouTube channel, so as many well, moving parts. Yeah. We can't really move it to another day and try to just rush it and get it done. You know, it doesn't turn out good that way. And we just literally don't have the time to get everything edited. There's a lot of work that goes into a, pro- a podcast, especially a podcast that has a video version mm-hmm. with media in it. It's just, there's a lot more to it than I think people realize. So, we apologize for missing the episode. Thank you guys so much for your support, you know, on social media and being cool about it. You know, we really, it really makes Shit us happens. feel a lot better. It <laughs> Shit does. happens. We do our best, we but do. stuff happens and we do the best that we can. You know, it's never mm-hmm. like, oh, we don't want to post. It's, it's always, we want to post, yeah. but sometimes things get in the way. Yeah. Things happen mm-hmm. and it just doesn't end up working out. And like Kendall said, we have so many things going on that we're juggling and it's sort of a domino effect. When one thing falls, the rest all get all fall eventually too it kind of messes things up so we try to you know if one thing doesn't work out we try to just move on and and go to the next Mm -hmm. thing and just keep everything else on track because there's a lot i mean we've got four podcasts now so it's a lot to juggle it's a lot to you know stay on top of schedule wise and all that so we do our best but plus we want to make sure that we do the best possible job for these cases you know we absolutely don't want to go and rush a case just to get something out because that's not fair to the family and the victim yeah, so we always want to try to get it right. So yes, sometimes we just got to take a little bit more time to to be prepared and, and get the right information. So but we do have a very interesting oh, yeah. episode for you guys today. This is a case that Josh and I have been personally interested in before you even started doing podcast before we yeah, started Mile Higher. When Kendall first started her, her, you know, doing true crime on our channel, I would just kind of listen. I mean, I've always loved true crime, too. So I just would watch or, or listen to it ever. Help she me was talk watching through it as and well kind of like researching. give her my thoughts and opinions on what mm-hmm. I think might have happened. And this is one of those cases. Yeah. We've wanted to cover it on the show, but we were hoping in the time since we've last, you know, looked into it, that there would be quite a few updates. Mm. A little bit, but yeah, not not as much as you would hope for in all of these years. But it's there's a lot of new theories and we kind of have looked at it with fresh eyes And we've got a lot to say. So I think you guys will be very interested in this. We're going to be talking about Bryce Las Pisa. And like I said, who mysteriously disappeared. Yeah. And that's the best way to very mysteriously. This case leaves you pretty frustrated and just reeling with theories and ideas of what could have happened. And I'm sure you will feel the same way as us. Yeah. A lot of people compare this case to the Maura Murray case and kind of call it the, the male, you know, Mm-hmm. armory case there's a lot of similarities in many different ways yep so that's what we're going to dive into today uh, before we do this episode's brought to you by upstart simply safe third love hell fresh and pendulum yes thank More you on to that later. our sponsors absolutely but shall we jump into the disappearance of bryce we Las shall Pisa? so bryce Las Pisa was born on april 30th 1994 he was raised as an only child in the chicago suburb of springfield illinois with his parents, Mike and Karen Las Pisa. According to his parents, they were a close-knit family as Bryce was growing up. They enjoyed spending a lot of time together, and all three of them had April birthdays, so he grew up celebrating a birthday month with his parents. Bryce had very bright red hair, pale blue eyes, a warm and engaging smile, and as a teenager, he had both of his ears pierced. 
He was known as a very friendly, cheerful person who was charismatic and always made friends easily. Growing up, he got good grades in school. He was a talented athlete playing football and baseball. Bryce graduated from Naperville Central High School in 2012, and shortly after, his parents retired and moved their family across the country to Laguna Niguel, California. Bryce really enjoyed living on the West Coast and didn't really have any trouble adjusting. He started going to Sierra College and planned to eventually transfer to a four-year university. Sierra College is in Northern California in Rockland, outside of Sacramento, about 465 miles from his parents' home in Laguna Niguel. Now, Bryce was a very gifted artist, super talented. We'll put some of his art up on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. He really had an eye for interesting design and could do incredibly really cool stuff. Smooth art that, you know, had really good line work. Yeah, I was going to say his his designs, he did a lot of like geometric, Mm -hmm. honestly, kind of psychedelic art. Yeah, it's really cool. It's really cool. So he made a new group of friends in California and started dating a fellow student who was named Kim Sly. He finished his first year of school in the spring of 2013 and then went back to live with his parents for the summer. During his summer break, he took an English class at a local college for additional credits and spent a lot of time with his family and his girlfriend, Kim. Then in August 2013, Bryce moved in with his close friend Sean Dixon for his sophomore year at Sierra College. His parents helped him get settled a few weeks before classes started, and Bryce was super stoked to get back to school and was his usual carefree, cheerful self. Kim had actually graduated the year before and was attending California State University in Chico, which the students called Chico State. She had an apartment about 90 miles from Bryce, and they saw each other as much as they could. Bryce's fall semester began on Monday, August 26, 2013, and that day he had a speech class and a web design class. He also talked to his mom, Karen, that night and told her all about his first day. He said he really liked his classes and still sounded very excited to be back at school. So Karen and Mike had no reason to be worried about their son. He was doing well in school and seemed to really be thriving. But his friends had noticed that since he had arrived back in town, something was just off about him. He didn't seem like himself. When Bryce was in high school, he might have had a few drinks at a party or occasionally smoked some weed with his friends, but now he was really overdoing it. And just to clarify, that's according to his parents. That's how they perceive things. We don't know that for sure. He was drinking a lot and an occasional beer soon turned into drinking hard liquor every day. Kim, Sean, and other friends tried to find out if something was wrong with him, but he always just brushed it off and said, you know what, I'm fine. Don't worry about me. And that he was just blowing off steam before the new semester. The week that classes started, he was still drinking every day, though. Yes, and one of his roommates said that he was going through two handles of liquor over one weekend. Which, I mean, that's that's a good amount. I, I mean, say. just for yourself, it's it's yeah, it definitely is a lot. On Tuesday, August twenty seventh, Kim thought there was something else going on. The way Bryce was acting was very different than when he just drank alcohol. And when she asked him about it, he denied that he had taken anything else. He had just been up late that night, and that was it. Kim kept pushing, though, and finally Bryce admitted that he had taken the stimulant Vyvanse. Stimulants like Vyvanse help calm the minds of those it's prescribed to commonly people diagnosed with ADHD. I've never taken Vyvanse before, so I can't say what that's like. You have, have too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've taken lots of different ADHD meds. Mm -hmm. I've taken pretty much all of them over my lifetime. Yeah. Uh, Vyvanse... Would you say it's a strong stimulant? Like I think it's just different for everybody. Vyvanse had the least effect of me on me compared to other, you know, Adderall, Ritalin, some stuff That's like that. That's um, interesting. I had the mm. best experience with Vyvanse out of all of them personally. Stop taking it for other reasons, but I didn't like Vyvanse very much. Yeah, you had a bad experience with it, huh? It was okay. Yeah, actually, Adderall was worse. Now that I think about it, but Adderall was worse for me too. It's interesting because Adderall and Vyvanse are both amphetamines, whereas um, Ritalin is not. Right. Uh, so, anyways, that's. But yeah, it's totally different. Everyone's going to react so differently. So it's kind of hard to be like, oh, Vyvanse. You know what that can do to you? Because some people do wonderful on it and take it right. every day and are great with it. Yeah, I think it's just completely but different for everyone. It is also like whether you're using it when you have ADHD or you're using it when you don't, because if you don't have it and you use it, it can feel very much like speed, like yes. anxiety, grinding teeth, like very overstimulated. If you're using it as a recreational drug, right. yeah, it oftentimes can make things harder, especially if 
your brain doesn't need that, Mm -hmm. you know, and you're just taking it totally, you know, it can have a really an opposite effect. Yeah. Like I've taken a stimulant drug before and personally it was just wild because I feel like I already think a lot just sober. But Mm -hmm. then when I took that, it was like, I could not stop thinking. It's just like thought loops and it's just my mind's racing and yeah, it actually created anxiety and stress and Mm. you're just like, make it stop. So it's interesting to me that for people that do have ADHD, it's actually having the opposite effect for most of us, but it still can have those effects on you, even if you have ADHD and and it totally depends on the dose and other things you're taking and Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So a lot of students obviously use, And sometimes abuse stimulants to stay awake all night to study or, you know, get ready for a test. Or to take it as a party drug so you can stay up party all night longer. Exactly. So Bryce had actually taken it to stay up to drink and play video games all night with his friend Sean. Kim was worried, but Bryce assured her this was no big deal. You know, I got this. They were just having fun before the semester really ramped up. It wasn't just the alcohol and prescription drugs. Bryce's behavior was erratic. He had given away his Xbox and a special pair of diamond earrings that his mom had given him. Very weird. When I first heard this, I was a little confused. I was like, why would his mom get him di- or give? I had thought it was like her giving was. some of her diamond earrings to him. They were a, a special pair that had some sentimental value for her that she gave to him. But I assume they were studs that diamond studs that he wore because could he had be. his ears pierced. He could be, or it could have just been something that was like gifted a to him to, gift hate, to hang on to. But what's so weird is he gave them away to a random friend instead of giving them back to his mom if he didn't want them for some reason. Yeah, so that's so that's interesting. Kim continued to express her concern, and that night Bryce also broke up with her over text. He told her that she would be better off without him. The following night, Wednesday, August 28th, Bryce ended up at Kim's apartment in Chico. And while they were arguing, Kim could tell that something was seriously wrong with Bryce. He kept trying to leave, but she didn't think that he should be driving. So she took his car keys and tried to persuade him just to sleep for a few hours before driving home. Around 11, Bryce called his mom, told her what was going on, and asked her to get on the phone and tell Kim that he was fine to drive and to give give him his keys back. Plus, Karen had already gotten a call from Sean about Bryce. He was also concerned because Bryce just hadn't been acting like himself. So now Kim was worried too, and that raised Karen's concern even more. Bryce talked to both of his parents during the call when he was at Kim's house, and he told them that he had just broken up with Kim, and now she wouldn't let him leave, and he just wanted to go home. Karen told him that she was very concerned that she was going to take the first flight out the next morning to be with him and kind of figure out what was going on. But he insisted that wasn't necessary. Before she booked a flight, there was something else that he wanted to tell her. He said he had a lot to talk to her about. And Karen had no idea what Bryce may have needed to tell her, but he sounded sure about it and his decision. So she agreed to hold off on visiting. He also didn't seem heartbroken at all about the breakup or in any type of crisis. He assured her that he was completely fine to drive home. I wonder if that was a red flag for his mom that he had just broken up with her and he was seemingly fine. Well, I I mean, I guess it could be now looking back, but thinking in that moment, maybe he was just tired of the relationship. Right, right. He's relieved to be out of it. Yeah, more so in hindsight, I wonder if she's like, Oh, I'm sure in hindsight. Everything is being thought about twice. Because it seems like, obviously, they were concerned about the drinking and, you know, the pill usage. But it seems to me more like just his overall behavior and his decision-making capabilities were very different from what Mm -hmm. they were used to. Right. And that's what they were most concerned about was the The fact that he was giving away stuff and all of a sudden he's ending relationships and, and all of that all of a sudden like this. Yeah. So Karen got on the phone with Kim and she ended up telling her to just go ahead and give Bryce his keys back. And he left Kim's apartment that night around 1130. When Karen woke up the next day, Thursday, August 29th, she had a missed call from Bryce. He had called around 1 a.m. She had assumed that it was to tell her that he had gotten home okay. Cell tower records show that when Bryce made the call, he was about an hour away from his place and more than 350 miles away from Kim's apartment. Very strange he went all that way after breaking up with her and leaving. 
He had driven past his college and was heading south towards the Tehachapi Mountains. Karen and Mike got an automated message from their insurance company after this, and the message said that there had been a request for roadside assistance on one of their vehicles at 9 a.m. that day. Bryce left his parents a voicemail around 11 a.m. saying that he had run out of gas in Kern County. He had called roadside assistance and charged $20 to their credit card for gas. Instead of going home the night before, Bryce had driven south on the I-5 in the direction of his parents' house in Laguna Niguel. To get to Kern County by 9 a.m., he would have had to drive straight through the night. But his parents hadn't pieced all this together at this point. And when they couldn't get a hold of Bryce, they called Sean, who told them that Bryce never came home the night before. And that's when they really got concerned. They called the repair shop where Bryce had used their credit card to buy the gas, and the call was answered by an employee named Christian. Christian said that he had responded to the request for roadside assistance and that he had met Bryce in a rest area in Buttonwillow, California, at 930 to give him three gallons of gas. And when he learned that Bryce's parents had been trying to reach him and were worried, he decided to just go drive back out to that rest area and check things out. Super nice of him. It had been about three hours since he had met Bryce there, so Christian assumed he would be long gone. So he was surprised when he found Bryce just parked in the exact same spot he was earlier that morning, sitting in his car. He was just sitting in the driver's seat with his head back. And when Christian approached the car, Bryce looked surprised to see him again. Bryce's eyes were a little red, but other than that, Christian thought he seemed perfectly fine. Christian told Bryce that his mother was worried about him and handed him his cell phone to call her. I'm sure Christian thought it was super weird that this guy's just sitting in the same spot from earlier when. To him, he probably was like, well, I brought you gas, so why don't you get back on your journey? But to be there just chilling in his car right where he left him, was he probably was just so confused. He's like, what is this guy doing? Everyone was confused, and it only gets more confusing. It was about 12.30 when Karen's phone rang. She picked it up, and she heard Bryce's voice on the other line. She was relieved because he still sounded fine, and he wasn't slurring his words or anything like that. He didn't even sound tired. She was still very confused about why Bryce was still at the rest area in Buttonwillow, but she decided, you know what, questions could wait until later. So she told Bryce to fill up his gas tank and then get back on Interstate 5 and drive to their house in Laguna Niguel. Once he got there, they could actually chat and figure out what was going on with him. They made the plan, and before hanging up, Karen told him that they would see him around 3 o'clock. But 3 o'clock came and went, and at 3.30, Bryce still wasn't there. Karen and Mike were getting more worried by the minute, so they tried calling him, but he didn't pick up. At that point, they thought maybe Bryce could be stuck in traffic, or maybe he decided to stop and get a bite to eat somewhere. That could easily take up an extra hour. But the hours went by and still no Bryce. They kept calling him and got no answer. So they started worrying that maybe Bryce had gotten into an accident. By 6 o'clock, they were really, really worried at this point, and that's when they called Orange County Sheriff's Department and reported their 19-year-old son missing. The police contacted their cell phone provider to ping Bryce's phone and find his location. Once they had the location, two Kern County deputies were sent out to look for him. And by the time they found Bryce, it had been almost 10 hours since he requested roadside assistance that morning. He was still in Buttonwillow parked on Lagoon Drive about eight miles from the rest area where Christian had brought him gas. So literally he was like, well, if this guy's going to keep coming back and checking on me, I'm going to move spots, but still stay in the area. So really weird. It's like, what's he doing? Just hanging out in Buttonwillow. After Bryce talked to his mom that afternoon, he had filled up his gas tank and drove toward I-5. But instead of getting on the interstate, he stopped and parked along Lagoon Drive. When the deputies approached him, he was polite and cooperative. He answered all their questions and he explained that he just needed to blow off some steam before driving home, which that would indicate maybe he was upset, potentially that his parents were continuing to check up on him or something. The officers gave him a field sobriety test and he passed without a problem. Bryce invited them to search his vehicle and when they did, they found no alcohol, drugs, or weapons. So after that, they're like, this guy seems fine. He doesn't have anything illegal on him. He seems totally coherent. So they had no reason to detain him. But before they left, the deputies did tell him to call his mom first because she was really worried because she had actually sent them up there to look for him. Bryce hesitated. It didn't seem likely that he was going to make that call. So one of the deputies called her up 
and told her they found her son. They told her that Bryce had passed a sobriety test and seemed completely fine to drive. The deputy then handed the phone to Bryce and Karen told him to get something to eat and then get on the interstate because it was time to come home. Once again, Bryce agreed with her plan and then hung up. The deputies reported that Bryce had been found and he was taken off of the missing person statewide database. A few hours later, Christian drove by and saw Bryce parked near the I-5 interstate and the whole thing started all over again. Christian called Karen to tell her where Bryce was and Karen got Bryce on the phone again and told him to drive home now. Imagine how confused his parents are at this point. Right. Like, what is going on? Like, Why, why is... doesn't he want to come home? Mm-hmm. And why is he just hanging out in this mm-hmm. random area, mm-hmm. seemingly in the middle of nowhere? Just sitting there alone yeah. for hours. Yeah, with no reason to be there, as far as I know. Once again, Bryce agreed. He got a soda from the nearby gas station, filled up his gas tank again, and got on the interstate. Christian actually followed him this time for about 10 miles to make sure he was driving okay, to make sure you know he was safe. And then he called Karen back and told her that Bryce was indeed on his way finally. The next time Karen heard from Bryce was at 1.50 a.m., now Friday, August 30th. He called his parents and said he was still in Kern County. He told them he had gotten off the interstate for a bit, but he was back on the road now and heading toward Laguna Niguel. He wasn't completely sure where he was, though but the ETA on his GPS said 325 AM. And what's very strange is his parents asked him to look for road marks or, uh, or like, I mean landmarks or street signs, something to kind of gauge have where he them w- figure out where he actually is since he wasn't sure where he was, but he said he couldn't see anything. He couldn't see any street signs, couldn't see any landmarks, nothing. I mean, it is dark in the middle well, of nowhere. Well, you can still see. Sure. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. That that was very weird to me. And his parents thought that was incredibly strange that he couldn't see anything. Yeah, I would I would probably be very confused about that as a parent too. If, mm-hmm. if they're like, yeah, I can't see any. Wait, you're driving and you can't see anything. Yeah, you're, you're driving with your headlights scary. off. What's yeah, going on? What's going on? He actually hung up on this call, but called back minutes later at 2.09 a.m. And he said he was too tired to keep driving. He said that he was off of the interstate and planned to sleep for a few hours in his car before driving home. He also agreed to call them the next morning before he got back on the road. And at this point, Bryce had been awake for about 48 hours. Don't you think it's kind of strange that at no point they just left their house and drove out to Yeah, him? it's only a couple hours away. Especially if he's like, I'm too tired to drive. And if they're that concerned, why wouldn't they be like, okay, well, then we'll come get you and Something's drive you home. Something's up, clearly. I don't know. I mean, I hate to judge anyone but that just that is odd to me i, I mean it's like, they're obviously concerned so yeah, why, rather than have all these other people go check up on your son yeah. why don't you just hop and in the they're car like 24 hours into this at this point and i scared. mean maybe i mean maybe they were going to but because bryce couldn't provide where he was yeah maybe they're like there's no way we're gonna because you got to remember too he's just out in the middle of nowhere i mean how are you gonna track him down when it's dark and you really guess, don't know where he is but guess, earlier in the but, day Absolutely. Yeah, and like, at this point, he'd been awake for 48 hours. Well, I don't know if they actually knew he had been awake for 48 hours. I mean, But they know he's been awake for a for, long time because they can do the math. I mean, maybe not 48 hours at that point that they're aware of, but they know he's been on the road for over 24 at that point. Yeah. Is it possible that he had taken Vivance or something to help him stay I mean, I think that's alert pretty alert obvious. Life. That's what he did. In order to not have to stop and sleep and maybe just sleeping was I just was think with him being close that close to them that i don't understand why they would agree to have him just sleep in the car and start coming back in the morning that seems very risky but you know everything's different in hindsight i guess so after a restless night of sleep karen and mike were woken up the next morning by their doorbell they assumed it must be bryce so they opened the door expecting to see him but instead they were greeted by a california highway patrol officer and he had some news It turns out at 5.30 that morning, a 911 call reported a 2003 beige Toyota Highlander had crashed 115 feet down a ravine. It turns out the car had landed at the bottom of a 25-foot embankment in Castaic Lake area. This is an unincorporated community in the Santa Clarita Valley in northern Los Angeles County. The SUV was found on its side 
on Main Ramp Road, which is the main boat access road of the man-made Castaic Lake, which is about two hours north of Laguna Niguel. So the CHP had responded to the 911 call and examined the scene. The back window of the SUV had been broken by an emergency tool, and there was also a little bit of blood on the passenger seat and also in the back seat, but not enough to suggest that anyone had been seriously injured in the crash. It wasn't much blood. Plus, there was no sign of Bryce. CHP officers contacted the sheriff's office to assist with the search, and officers found Bryce's phone, his wallet, his laptop, and a duffel bag filled with his clothes on the scene. And actually, his wallet, and I believe his phone, was just dropped outside of the car. It wasn't even found in the vehicle. So it clearly been dropped by him, probably on purpose as he was leaving the scene. Yeah, otherwise it would have been in the vehicle. Right. Unless he brought it out of the vehicle. There are conflicting reports about which personal items were found in the SUV and which were found on the road. Most reports said that his phone and laptop were definitely in the SUV and that the wallet and duffel bag may have been in the vehicle or may have just been on the road outside of the vehicle. The disappeared episode by um, investigation, investigation discovery definitely talked about his wallet being dropped on the side of the road. But yeah, it's really confusing. A lot of the details of this case are kind of unconfirmed and confusing to follow. So another bag was found in the backseat, which may have contained his laptop. The duffel bag had been opened and it looked like someone had gone through it for something. No witnesses saw the crash as far as we know, but there was a surveillance camera in the area and the camera took a photo of each passing car's license plate as they exited the interstate onto Lake Hughes Road, which led up the hill to Castaic Lake Recreation Area. The SUV had crashed about 100 feet from Lake Hughes Road. The camera documents which cars went up the hill, but there are no cameras to see cars coming back down. Bryce's SUV was photographed as it headed up the hill at 2.15 a.m., just a few minutes after he had talked to his parents and said he was too tired to continue making the drive. His SUV passed the camera again at 4.29 a.m., heading back up the road. Very confusing. So he like made a huge loop, basically. There's no way to know what time Bryce had actually driven back down either time. The 911 call was made less than an hour later, and based on the track pattern on the road, investigators believe the driver of the SUV sped up and never hit the brakes. If this is true, the crash is pretty likely not on accident. I'm sure most of you agree. Bryce most likely intentionally drove off of that embankment. Well, I mean, there's just no way that he didn't because mm -hmm. it's just the, the, the way that the roads are mm -hmm. and we'll put up a picture of a satellite photo of this area there. It just would make absolutely no sense for somebody to just like, it's not like you could take a wrong turn here. Cause it's like curving different ways mm -hmm. away from each other though. I just don't see how he could have accidentally just driven off the road off this, off this seemingly cliff that that's mm -hmm. right here. So, so we will continue on with more information about the search for Bryce Las Pisa as soon as we take a quick ad break. The science is clear. A healthy gut microbiome with the good bacteria that help our bodies process food is a key to a healthy lifestyle. But we're learning about the connection between your gut microbiome health and type 2 diabetes. Pendulum glucose control is the first and only medical probiotic that's designed to manage A1C and blood glucose levels through the health of your microbiome. Over time, people with type 2 diabetes lose the gut bacteria that help digest fiber and manage our blood glucose levels. For those with type 2 diabetes, diet and exercise alone are often not enough to manage it. The best approach emphasizes diet, exercise, and a healthy gut microbiome. And this connection has been widely recognized by leading scientists studying diabetes, including the American Diabetes Association, Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins, and others. For those with type 2 diabetes, it can feel like an uphill battle to keep glucose and A1C levels where you need them to be. Diet and exercise are still important, but if you struggle to manage your levels with diet and exercise alone, your gut microbiome might need some attention. Pendulum Glucose Control helps fill in the gaps by providing the first and only probiotic designed to manage blood glucose and A1C levels. With Pendulum, you can feel in control of your levels and not the other way around. 
What's unique about Pendulum is that their team of scientists, doctors, and innovators isolated the unique strains of beneficial gut bacteria that help people with type 2 diabetes manage their blood sugar levels. They've isolated one keystone strain, Acromancia, that is now available to purchase. Pendulum is the only place to find this highly sought after strain. It's formulated and bottled in the U.S. with the highest safety and quality standards, non-GMO project verified. So take control of your glucose levels today and try Pendulum Glucose Control for 90 days. And if you're not satisfied with your levels after that, you'll get your money back. Visit PendulumLife.com to find out more and use promo code MileHire for 20% off your first bottle of membership. That's P-E-N-D-U-L-U-M-L-I-F-E.com. Promo code MileHire. We all know that while you want to look your best and be supported by your undergarments, it's incredibly important to most of us that they also are comfortable and that we're not dying to get out of them by the end of the day. And that's why I love Third Love bras. I've talked about it so many times. They are the only bras I wear. I truly love them and have been wearing them for years. Third Love believes that everybody is amazing and deserves to be treated that way. That's why they designed underwear, loungewear, activewear, and feel good all day wear that can hug better, hold stronger, and support for longer. So you can feel comfortable all day, no matter what your body faces. Third Love obsesses over every stitch, so you never have to think about how something feels, looks, or wears. And while trends come and go, Third Love has always stayed true to one notion. We do comfort, and you do you. And what's great is their bras come in exclusive half cups to make sure that you're getting the best fit possible. Their underwear, loungewear, and activewear comes in sizes extra small through 3X. And they have this great fitting room quiz that's kind of like a personal shopper, but better. It focuses on size, breast shape, and current fit issues, plus your personal style to find the perfect bra and underwear for you. Plus, we love that Third Love gives back. They are the largest donor of undergarments in the United States and have partnered with organizations across the whole country and have donated over $40 million worth of bras to help people in need. At the end of the day, feeling is believing. So upgrade to pieces that your body loves just as much as you do. Right now, you can get 20% off your order at thirdlove.com slash mile higher. That's 20% off at thirdlove.com slash mile higher. Imagine if every crime could be halted before it happened. Well, while you can't stop every criminal in their tracks, what if you could deter them? That's what Simply Safe's new wireless outdoor security camera does. It's wireless, so it can install anywhere, extending Simply Safe's perimeter of defense from your windows and doors to the far corners of your property. I absolutely love Simply Safe. I think it's hands down the best security system on the market because it's so easy to use. You can literally set it up yourself. It is absolutely the best camera system I've ever used before. And I love the outdoor security cameras because with our property, we have a pretty big property. So sometimes, you know, there's not outlets or places to plug in cameras. But with these wireless outdoor security cameras, I can make sure all the corners of my land are covered and I can see them 24 seven whenever I want to. I love the cameras because they have an ultra wide 140 degree field of view. So you can keep watch over your entire yard or house. It has a 1080p HD resolution with an eight times zoom, which is amazing. So if something happens, you can actually zoom in and clearly see things like faces and license plates in order to capture critical evidence. Best of all, it has a rechargeable battery that's easy to remove, so it doesn't need an outlet and can literally go anywhere you want to. This camera has it all and it integrates with your Simply Safe home security system, extending its protection to the outside. This means that every door, window and room are protected and now the outside of your home will be too. Seriously, this is the easiest system. And the great thing about if you go to their website, you can actually customize your system to exactly what you need. You can even get a system that's for your apartment or it doesn't matter how small your space is. If you want that peace of mind at night when you go to sleep that you are protected or when you're away, you know, if somebody tries to break in, help is on the way and you're going to be protected and you can check in on what's going on in and outside of your home whenever you want. It's an amazing system. Highly recommend it. So to learn more about the exciting new Simply Safe wireless outdoor security camera, visit simplysafe.com slash mile higher. Simply Safe is offering 20% off your entire new system and your first month of monitoring service free when you enroll in interactive monitoring today. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash mile higher. You can't put a price on peace of mind. So obviously at this point, everybody's very, very confused. I mean, whenever you find a vehicle that seemingly went off of a cliff that's badly damaged and there's belongings to somebody just lying on the road and in the vehicle still, and there's no 
person or body nearby? I mean, that's a big, big question mark for the authorities. So by 11.30 a.m. on Friday morning, August 30th, the Sheriff's Department had launched a massive search effort covering Castaic Lake, the city, and the surrounding mountains. The search was conducted by the Parks Bureau deputies, Sheriff's deputies, the Santa Clarita Valley Search and Rescue Team, canine units, divers, officers on horseback, and a patrol helicopter. So obviously a ton of different people and specialized units brought in to help look for Bryce. The search continued until late that night, and on-duty patrol deputies continued to search the area overnight. Efforts continued throughout the weekend, and then the search was extended into the next week. Ground, water, and aerial crews were dispatched across the area. The mountain enforcement detail, which were the officers on horseback, were able to venture into the most remote area. So we're talking about a very, very deep search into this area around where the wreck was. LA County Parks and Recreation Lake lifeguards helped officers search the lake by boat and the dock area. Divers were equipped with underwater cameras to thoroughly search the water. Because, I mean, at this point, I mean, that's probably what they're thinking is he must have ended up in the water somehow. If you can't find him, I mean, with all right. of those Right, if he's not around the vehicle, how, where yeah, the hell did he go? I know. Officers also checked local hotels and hospitals for reports of an injured man that matched Bryce's description. And when that led nowhere, they expanded to surrounding cities. On Tuesday, September 3rd, deputies were sent to search nearby San Francisco Canyon, which cuts through the Sierra Palona Mountains and the Angeles National Forest. And because there had been no signs of foul play at the crash site, the first thing that came to mind to investigators was that Bryce had been suicidal. When he had survived the crash, he may have wandered into the wilderness because he was possibly injured and disoriented. Investigators also started interviewing Bryce's friends and family members and quickly learned that his friends at college had actually been very worried about his recent erratic behavior. Kim told them about the last time she saw Bryce at her apartment and how she was worried when he had left to drive home. Sean told them that Bryce had taken Vivance the night before and had been up all night before making the drive. He also said Bryce had been drinking that day as well. His parents said that he was far from an outdoorsman. He had never gone camping or fishing growing up and didn't know anything about surviving in the wilderness. Because this area that he ended up in is actually a very much that type of place where people go camping, mm -hmm. enjoy the great outdoors and all that. So it's kind of, it was odd that he was there for whatever reason. It's not like he's just out there yeah, and surviving out right. there easily. Right. As far as anyone knew, Bryce wasn't familiar with the area, and everyone who knew him said he wouldn't hitchhike. But we don't know that, obviously. People he do was doing a lot of things he didn't normally expect. do. Yeah. Right. In November 2011, a missing adult alert system was put in place, but according to Bryce's parents, it simply did not work. It was supposed to function like the Amber Alert for children or the Silver Alert for seniors. But before anything could happen, the National Crime Information Center had to be involved. And basically several steps needed to be taken before an alert could be issued and the process was painfully slow that's terrible i know right we have these systems in place but there's this whole long process in order to even utilize it and this was a long time ago so i'm sure it's different now let's hope it's better now karen and mike quickly took matters into their own hands and started a facebook page to help find bryce and the page was launched on september 1st 2013. The police investigation continued and investigators downloaded the data from Bryce's cell phone and laptop. They completed a detailed analysis using search words and other specific information, but there was absolutely nothing that could help them find where Bryce was. Blood analysis of the samples taken from the SUV confirmed that it was indeed Bryce's blood. And at 6 a.m. on Wednesday, September 4th, a burned body was found close to Lake Hughes Road near Castaic Lake. Investigators knew right away that it could be Bryce. A cyclist had reported a small brush fire off of the road, and when firefighters put out the flames, they found a charred body that was so burned, there was no way to determine the age or race. Investigators believed it was male, though, and that was all they could tell Bryce's family until forensic analysis could be done. So Karen and Mike had to wait very anxiously for an update on the body as the search for Bryce continued. So the following day, September 5th, officers on horseback headed into a remote area with a very rough terrain. Bryce's dirty clothes and shoes helped tracking dogs pick up his scent not far from where the SUV had crashed. They had followed it from the main boat launch area called Government Cove. 
to a roadway that crossed a dam and then to a nearby truck stop. To them, it looked like Bryce had left the crash site, walked up to the truck stop, possibly to get help. So authorities launched a renewed search effort in Government Cove and all along the path that Bryce had walked. Mike and Karen's brother, so Bryce's uncle, also joined the search on September 9th. Up until that point, the family had been focused on their efforts and spreading awareness about Bryce's disappearance online and in the media. Neither of them had any hiking or tracking experience, and they just weren't familiar with the area. But they knew they couldn't just sit home and wait anymore. But thankfully, more help was on the way. Two organizations, the Class Kids and the Team Amber Rescue, stepped up to assist the family. These organizations coordinated additional searches and assisted the police in following up on potential leads. Someone in Curry County, Oregon, had reported a sighting of Bryce near a lake. And there were also tips coming in from the areas of San Clarita with large populations of unhoused people. Every lead had to be followed up on, and if there was any chance that Bryce had been in the area, it had to be searched. Finally, on September 17th, the burned body that was found near Castaic Lake was identified, and it wasn't Bryce. It was actually 35-year-old Lamandra Miles. He had been shot and killed on September 3rd. After he was dead, his body was dumped near the lake and burned. Investigators determined that his murder was not connected to Bryce's disappearance. So the following day, September 18th, the search for Bryce was officially called off. Investigators had scoured the area for nearly three weeks and found no trace of him. Volunteers continued to join the searches that were organized by Bryce's family and class kids. Class kids led multiple searches in October of 2013, covering all the areas along the Castaic Lake shoreline. And as public interest kind of waned, Karen and Mike were desperate to keep Bryce's name and face out there. They designed a flyer and made versions in both English and Spanish, and a local office, Max, actually agreed to print the flyers for free, so they were able to distribute thousands. Lamar Advertising also agreed to put the flyer on three digital billboards for free to help spread awareness. Also, the Missing Children Notices program, which prints and distributes large binders filled with information about missing people, also featured Bryce's case on the front cover. Their family gave out free wristbands that promoted their Facebook page, and everyone continued to post on social media using the hashtags Bring Bryce Home and Find Bryce Las Pisa. His ex-girlfriend, Kim Sly, was a big part of the search efforts and worked closely with parents. She posted on social media that she loves Bryce and she will never stop searching for him. Vigils were held at Sierra College, also in Castaic Lake, and in Bryce's hometown of Naperville, Illinois. And for a while, these vigils helped keep the case in the media. And during all this time, volunteers continued to hike along remote trails, put up as many flyers as they could, called shelters, hospitals, and any organizations where Bryce may have gone for help. And for months after Bryce's disappearance, park employees who were a part of the initial search efforts just continued to patrol the area. But the odds that Bryce were still there were very slim at this point. Castaic Lake is a popular recreation area that has visitors year round. Thousands of people come up every year to camp, hike, fish, and spend time on the lake. And no one has ever reported a sighting of Bryce. As the lead started to dwindle, Karen and Mike decided to hire a private investigator who had the resources to follow up on potential sightings of Bryce. In August 2015, Karen and Mike took a trip to Castaic Lake. And while there, they hired a sonar boat to search the water and their private investigator arranged for a drone operator to search a specific area near the main boat access road. After two days of searching, they found no signs of human remains. And around this time, they also met with the film crew for the ID Discovery show Disappeared, which had agreed to feature Bryce. The show actually aired in 2016 and brought nationwide exposure to his disappearance that resulted in many new leads, but ultimately these leads led nowhere. In May 2016, Bryce's family launched a GoFundMe to raise $3,800 to put up a billboard for two months. They were able to raise the funds by November of that year, and the billboard went up near Lake Hughes Road in Castaic. The family was really hoping that hopefully this would bring in some new leads and information. Before we go ahead and dive into all of the theories and some of the latest updates with the case, we're going to go ahead and take another ad break and we'll be right back. As soon as I turned 18 years old, you know what the first thing I did was? I went and opened a credit card and then I opened a few more because when I was young 
and dumb, I didn't realize that if I rack up bills on this credit card, I got to pay it off or I'm going to get slammed with high interest rates. And sure enough, over time, I stacked up multiple credit cards with high balances. And I was just in this never ending cycle of paying interest every month so that I, it doesn't hurt my credit at that point. But I was never able to pay off that debt. So what did I do? Eventually, I figured out that there's personal loans out there like Upstart that was able to help me consolidate all of that debt, pay off those credit cards and get a lower interest rate that I was able to chip away at over time. And eventually I was able to get myself completely out of credit card debt and I owe it all to that personal loan. This is why I highly recommend Upstart for anybody that is in debt and wants to get out of it because it really is the fast and easy way to get your debt paid off by getting a personal loan all online. Whether it's paying off those credit cards, maybe you're consolidating high interest debt or just funding personal expenses. Maybe there's something you want, you need to buy a wedding or something like that. A personal loan through Upstart could be a great option for you. With Upstart, you get one fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date. And rather than looking at your credit score alone, Upstart considers other factors like your income, current employment and credit history to help you find a smarter rate for your loan. You can check your rate without impacting your credit score in minutes. So there's no risk for at least looking at what you could be approved for. And you can get loans between $1,000 to $50,000. You can even receive these funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. So find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash mile higher. That's upstart.com slash mile higher. And don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit income and certain other information provided in your loan application. Again, that's upstart.com slash mile higher. So we all know that fall can be hectic, but HelloFresh's recipes save time that you'd otherwise spend on meal prepping, planning, grocery shopping, and chopping. So HelloFresh can help you focus on getting back into a new routine and spending more quality time with your family. HelloFresh offers 50 menu and market items to choose from every week, including vegetarian, calorie smart, and gourmet options, providing plenty of variety. And their ingredients travel from the farm to your door within a week, so you get the convenience without skipping out on the quality. And a lot of people don't know this, but HelloFresh isn't just for meals. It's also a marketplace that features a variety of snacks, like this fall's pumpkin cinnamon rolls to get you in the mood for a cozy season. And you get a better value with HelloFresh. They are over 30% cheaper than shopping at the grocery store. And with pre-portioned ingredients, they ensure that you won't you know, spend any extra money or waste excess food while also saving you a shopping trip. And HelloFresh offers flexibility. You can easily customize your order on their website or in the app within minutes. Easily change your delivery day, your food preferences for the week, your plan size, or just skip a week whenever you need to. Josh and I are so busy between running our two businesses that HelloFresh really saves us a lot of time. It just takes the thinking out of it and it's there at the end of the day. It's just such a relief to know you have that HelloFresh meal waiting for you in the fridge and you can still cook a healthy dinner without having to stress over it. So go to HelloFresh.com slash MileHire14 and use code MileHire14 for up to 14 free meals, and that includes free shipping. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash MileHire14 and use code MileHire14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. So as you can imagine, there are tons of theories online about what could have happened to Bryce, especially with no information and getting no real new leads from the billboards and all of their other efforts it only brings on more theories and speculation, unverified rumors, but none of them have been definitively ruled out. Many people think that Bryce could have been experiencing a mental health crisis. Symptoms of schizophrenia, for example, can appear in the late teens or early 20s, and especially in males. Symptoms of schizophrenia include delusional thinking, losing touch with reality, disorganized speech and behavior, amnesia, difficulty concentrating, self-harm, just to name a few. Bryce may have been suffering from amnesia, either from mental illness or from a head injury sustained during the crash. If this is the case, he could have ended up somewhere and had no idea where he was or even who he is and where he's from. Suffering from severe mental illness or amnesia could have led Bryce to one of the many communities of unhoused people across California. There have been multiple reported sightings of someone who looks like Bryce in some of these communities in Santa Clarita, especially. We know Bryce was definitely sleep deprived, which causes issues with memory, concentration, mood stabilization. And in extreme cases, sleep deprivation can lead to hallucinations, 
paranoia, delusional thinking, cognitive impairment, and psychosis. Personally, I think the idea that he had a mental illness or something like that, or early onset schizophrenia is probably unlikely just due to the mere fact that I feel like other people would have brought Mm -hmm. that up. His parents probably would have noticed signs of a a mental illness. Yeah, there weren't many other symptoms that we know of. Right. As far as we know, I could be wrong. There could be more information Mm -hmm. that I just don't know. But as far as what we do know, I don't I don't know if there's enough to say that it was mental illness. But amnesia is one of those things that could be a possibility due to the fact that there was this wreck. And if Bryce was in it, in the vehicle as Mm -hmm. it went over the ledge and crashed onto the road below, it is very possible that he suffered a traumatic brain injury or something like that that Mm -hmm. triggered amnesia. And he just sort of, you know, lost where he was and maybe wandered off into, you know, no man's land and just you know, that's why we can't find him. I mean, it's definitely a possibility, but it doesn't explain everything else leading up to the crash. It doesn't explain him giving away the earrings, him sitting at that spot for so long, you know, acting strange to his parents, not seeming to want to go home. You know, I don't know if that really lines up with him getting amnesia after the car. Accident. Yeah, I don't think so either, because the fact that the bloodhounds, when they tracked his scent from the crash site back mm-hmm. to the truck stop, I, I did a little Google Maps directions, and that's like an hour-long walk. Right. Totally doable by somebody, and it seems likely that he walked away from the crash and made his way back to that truck stop. So mm-hmm. if you had amnesia, that would have been hard. The pot, to do. That would be probably pretty difficult to yeah. then make your way back into town. Mm-hmm. The exact right way you know and and if he really did have amnesia and is just walking around castaic lake or a close by area you'd think that with how many people have searched how many volunteers and professionals that they would have found him yeah you would think i mean it seems like they did a very very exhaustive search of the area i mean they got every resource that we have for searching for missing people on this case and ultimately they found absolutely nothing to indicate that Mm -hmm. Bryce was still in the area. Mm -hmm. So it just, it seems very unlikely to me that it's one of these where he just got amnesia or was schizophrenic and just kind of wandered off and disappeared without a trace. Well, it seems like the most common theory that people have at least online is that Bryce may have wanted to disappear, that he could have simply run away from his current life and started over somewhere else. And like we said earlier, many people have expressed just their suspicion about his parents and questioned why one of them just didn't drive out to Buttonwillow after all of that, going back and forth for hours and sending out this person and that person. And he was so close by, why let him sleep in the car? It really just doesn't make that much sense. You know, Buttonwillow wouldn't have been that far of a drive. Why wouldn't they have just gone and picked him up and gotten him home safely? Karen has been criticized for telling Kim to give Bryce his car keys that night that he was at her apartment because Kim did make it very clear that she did not think he should be driving. And at this point, Karen had already heard from Sean that he was worried about Bryce as well. And during that phone call, Kim said that she was concerned about Bryce's mental state and his ability to drive safely. Of course, this is completely speculative and unproven, but many have brought up the possibility that Bryce's parents know something about his mental health that they haven't revealed. And if that's the case, that's their right to not disclose that information to the public. There's been a lot of discussion about Bryce possibly being on drugs, maybe more than what his parents thought. They talked in the ID Discovery episode that, you know, he had his fair share, as they said, of experimenting with drugs and alcohol for a teenage boy, but they never thought it was anything extreme. However, there have been other claims, unverified claims, of course, that have gone around that he could have been doing a lot more than what they thought. So there is a post on Reddit that a few of you have actually sent to us. And of course, this is Reddit. We can't verify this information, but it seems that many people believe that this post could really have some truth to it. And so we did want to share this with you because it kind of gives you a different perspective on everything. So this person on Reddit claims that they were friends with Bryce in high school and that back then he was quite the druggy, but a very friendly dude. Let's go ahead and read the whole post. So the post that I found was actually originally posted two years ago by an account called the anonymous hooligan. So you can take that for what it is. Yeah. But according to people who have commented on this and after I read it, it seems like whoever this person was 
seems honest, but then again, I mean, it's the internet, so yeah. you never know. Take it for what you will. Take it with a grain of salt. People kind of are like this, something of an insider here, mm -hmm. but this is how it reads. It says, I can say with certainty that there were issues between Bryce and his family. While Bryce's mother, Karen, is an unrepentant psycho, I am told that Bryce had a tight, borderline codependent relationship with her in the years leading up to his disappearance, but not much is known about their relationship in the final year or so. His relationship with his father, Mike, was at times very tumultuous, as Mike would lose his temper, yell, and scream at Bryce over things as trivial as not understanding how to complete his math homework. I don't know if the relationship was ever physically violent, but there was most definitely a lot of verbal, emotional abuse going on in that household, and not just with Bryce. The latter part of Bryce's teen years were marred by a few incidents, such as getting busted with MDMA, as well as a lot of underage drinking issues that have gone largely unreported, all of which served to soil his familial ties. As I understand, Bryce was well on his way to becoming a teenage alcoholic. He was apparently known for taking booze to high school and spending some school days maintaining a desired level of intoxication. It's very safe to assume that this behavior continued to spiral out, evidenced by his taste for Adderall and other scripts, and he suffered a psychotic break from it, which was evidenced by his friends calling his mother with their concerns. It must have been some pretty disturbing behavior in order for kids who all use drugs recreationally to contact their friend's parents with concerns about his mental state. When Bryce left home to attend community college at Sierra College, he did not do so by his own motivation. Karen and Mike shopped around for a while for what school he would attend, gave him no decision in the matter, and shipped him out when the school year began. The decision was based in part on the availability of dormitories as they wanted Bryce out of the home as soon as possible, which seems in keeping of what I know to be true of their parenting, quote unquote. They sent him to Sierra College in Rockland, California, which is 460 mile drive from his parents' home in Laguna Niguel. Mike and Karen were both very controlling parents, the type that foster harsh, rebellious behavior from their children. They sought to control every aspect of his life and use their money to do so. Bryce owned literally nothing of his own and was frequently reminded of it when he stepped out of line. And to me, his actions were a great big fuck you to his manipulative, controlling, abusive parents. What better way to let them know you're done with them by intentionally wrecking their car and leaving behind all the things they paid for with their money and leveraged as a means of control. The time he spent in that small rural town was most likely waiting on someone to give him a ride. I believe the big story he wanted to tell his family was that he would be dropping out of school and moving elsewhere. I believe he wanted to say it to their faces but chickened out and decided that he was going to just move on. I believe his family knows this and have used the media, his friends, and so on to wage a pressure campaign against him. I believe the police have encountered him at some point and have respected a request for silence, thus leading them to their conclusion that he is voluntarily missing. Voluntarily missing. When I first read this, I definitely sort of was able to put the pieces together, especially after you watch interviews of Karen and Mike mm -hmm. and the Disappeared episode. It's definitely a little weird and sort of the parenting style that they, they may have led does kind of seem to line up with, with the situation and all the information that we know. But then again, I mean, what do we really know about how right. they raise their child? We yeah. just, it's, we're, you know, speculating on this. Yeah. And this person only knows so much. It's not like they were that close to the family. A lot of this was, I've heard this, I've heard that. And we really don't know. Although this is, the idea that they could have really been strict on him does make a lot of sense. Um, he, I mean, he, from multiple friends, they said that he was dealing with a lot of pressure, felt a lot of stress. And it does seem that he was being kind of forced to be in school and, and feeling a lot of that, like I said, pressure from them. Um, but again, it's, it's so hard to judge a family just from one disappeared episode and to really know what was going behind on behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, none there, of us were were there were moments, I'll just honestly say, that rubbed me the wrong way in the episode that I felt like this this post could be true, but at the same time it could be completely made up. Um Yeah, it's really hard to say. I mean, obviously we don't know who we have no way to verify these things, but it's interesting to me that as you start going through some of the different theories and rumors that are out there that a lot of the information sort of lines up. I mean, it seems very, very clear that Bryce was experimenting with drugs. Yes, there are other rumors online that Bryce was 
a full on drug addict, that he had been kicked out of the dorms at Sierra College his freshman year for partying too much and that he may not have been allowed to return to the dorms the following year, which is why he moved in with Sean. Of course, that's unverifiable as well, but we figured it was worth mentioning since there's such a hold on information. And if that's the case and his parents were dealing with his drinking and and drugs Mm -hmm. for a long time, it makes sense why they would want to sort of Mm -hmm. control his path and get him out of the house and kind of get, you know, because obviously he didn't like to live there with them if if he was constantly getting in trouble and they were constantly getting on him for for these different things that he was doing. So I get that. And I I honestly kind of relate to if that's the case where they're leveraging control over his possessions and stuff. I mean, I've definitely been there in yeah, the past you have. and I've, I know what that's like and mm-hmm. I know what having controlling parents is like to the point where they're like I own everything you have and and mm-hmm. basically if you step out of line at all we're just going to take these things especially when you get older and into your later teenage years that can be very very difficult to deal with and honestly parents are like you know parents might be like oh we're cracking down because we're trying to make positive changes in him but at that age especially it's hard to sort of see mm-hmm. that when your parents do that so the first sort of natural response is to rebel and just do it more and yeah. you know you know not care and or so want to completely break away because you don't want to be under that scrutiny your whole life right exactly. and there are two things that we know for sure that do make me think that maybe there could be some validity to this post one obviously we know bryce didn't seem to want to go home to his parents yeah he didn't even clearly. want to talk to them on the phone that kind of makes you think and then the earrings. His mom gifted him important sentimental diamond earrings and he gave them to another friend. I mean, that's a kind of a big fuck you to his parents. And that makes sense with what that Reddit user said. Yeah, I was also, when I was first reading about this, thinking about how a lot of times when people have made the decision that they're gonna take their life, that they give important values away, right. trying to kind of wrap things up in their life. And although maybe that's not the case, it is interesting that he, if this is true to some degree, was ending his life as he knew it, you know, the life he was living. Right. To start a new life to, Mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, who knows, but it is interesting. Yeah. How he gave those things away. And does that have something to do with the fact that he was planning to leave? And Mm -hmm. is he trying to, you know, kind of wrap up his life and maybe he didn't want to give it back to his mom because his mom would be like, what the fuck? So instead he maybe gave it to someone else. That's true. Um, I do think it's interesting though, that if he was going to leave, why would he not sell the earrings? Because he could probably use that money, but again, who knows what he was going to leave and where else he was going to go, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So that's interesting. And there were multiple items that he gave away to friends. I believe an Xbox or an Xbox controller. Which oftentimes is what people do when they're taking their That's what most people think. Most people Mm -hmm. think that Bryce was basically prepping to take his own life, that mm-hmm. he just had enough of his parents, he had enough of all of the control or over start him. a new life. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm just talking about the right. take your own life mm-hmm. theory for a second mm-hmm. here. And just so like a lot of people are like a lot of the actions that he made kind of match up with somebody who sort of, you know, just get rid of all Same of thing it. with Mara Murray, right? Right, right. A lot and of that, her actions leading totally. up kind so of at seemed first like glance, suicidal. And the drive off the cliff thing yeah. and all that, that all makes sense. But then it doesn't make sense because the scent is traced back to the mm-hmm. truck stop nine days later mm-hmm. after the crash actually happened. So that would tell you that that scent was fresh. And, yeah. and again, was- going back to the earrings, I'm sorry to repeat this, but I just can't get over it. I feel if even if he was going to take his life or going to leave his life, Maybe he would have left them for someone to give to his mom if they meant something to his mom. His mom said they were a very nice gift. She can't understand why he would possibly give them to some random person. I just keep going back to how odd that is. It seems like an angry move to just give something so important to someone else. But of course, we don't know his mindset. We don't know if he was even rationally thinking these things through. Yeah, I also think it could be a sign of guilt um, and like shame rather than could giving be. it back to his mom could be but because. i mean he could have left them there for her to eventually find why go and out of your way to just give them to someone else yeah and I not mean, even he could have sell them know. yeah it's it's all really weird what's interesting to me too is the fact that he had these items with him in the vehicle 
you know, he had the bag, the duffel bag, he had his laptop. So he clearly had all these items that somebody who was going to go on the run or just leave their life altogether and go start anew would have likely taken with them. But the fact that those were just sort of left behind and like we had mentioned earlier, potentially left on purpose outside of the vehicle after the crash. Mm. Seems like he was walking away from his life. People, people, yeah, people would say that's the post was like, this is, that's the ultimate fuck you to crash Mm -hmm. their car that they got Mm -hmm. you to leave your wallet, your everything Mm -hmm. that your parents bought you completely behind and say, you know, I don't need you guys. I don't need your stuff. I don't need your, I don't need the control over me anymore. I'm just going to completely go start completely fresh on my own. And for the police to have said he's voluntarily missing. That's the biggest indicator there that he most likely left on his own accord and and very well but did he leave still injured. Be alive and out there did he leave injured though that's what we the craziest know. thing to me is that's a steep i mean that's a serious crash and if you're in that mm-hmm. vehicle i feel like you're going to be injured in some way yeah and i guess we don't know even for sure that he was in the vehicle right that and that was my my initial thought is that he somehow sent the vehicle over the edge and but he would have had to have been had Something but there's the marks accelerating th- like based on the That's tracks confusing. there was acceleration you down put a rock on it we talked about that last night but then the rock most, most likely would have been found unless it perfectly flew out the broken window i just don't know there, and, that, and that's the thing though is there could be details in the crash report that mm-hmm. just we don't know about that's just not public I'm sure there are I'm and that sure there's there more info that might suggest especially now that they're saying voluntarily missing i mean there could be mm-hmm. There could be indicators and evidence to suggest that this was purposely sent over and he wasn't in it Mm -hmm. based upon what they found that just hasn't been released to the public for some reason. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that could be at play here because I I just have a hard time imagining going off of a cliff in a a vehicle like that, Mm -hmm. airbags go off, potentially glass and whatever else is flying through the air. I mean, you're going to probably be at least shaken up by that, Mm -hmm. but potentially injured in some way. So then he got out of the vehicle, dropped, the looked window, through, grabbed out. what he needed and then left it and then just took off on foot. And wouldn't there have been more blood? It almost seems like maybe he cut himself and created blood at the scene right? to make it look like this accident happened. But I don't know. I don't know the, the thinking behind it. It doesn't make complete sense. Because it's like, why, you know, if you're going to fake your, if you're going to yeah, fake your suicide or, or, or right. whatever, why do it this way? Mm-hmm. Or if you're going to disappear and just run away, why not just like pull off to the side of the road and abandon the vehicle? Why crash it? Yeah. That's what I'm like. So why did they crash it? And and like, maybe it was just a big fuck you to his parents because he just didn't, he was like, screw you guys. I'm going to. And for a second, can we just talk about the actions leading up to it? Breaking up with his girlfriend clearly wanted yeah. to leave that situation, was going off to start something new. And then he goes and just sits in this strange spot in this area he's never been. Didn't even think about gas. Like it didn't, I mean, to just stay there, it almost seems like he was possibly waiting for someone. Or contemplating something. Yeah. Which people say maybe he was contemplating taking his own life and he finally ended up doing it or comp- contemplating how to pull this move how to get away from them because right, uh, clearly right. he did not mean for them to find out that he was in button willow and know no, where he was and no. track him down he was trying to leave and he i'm sure he was trying to like shit well i got to go back to the drawing board of how i'm going to pull this off and leave he could have been experiencing a manic episode as well yeah um and not fully being able to make a rational decision or think rationally and yeah that's if you're true. awake for that long, I don't know how long he was awake. If he is abusing Vyvanse, if he's mixing it with alcohol, stimulant, depressant. I mean, there's lots of different reasons that mm-hmm. someone could have gone into a yeah unwell mental state, I guess you could say, and whether that's mani- man- mania or not. I don't know. Right. I think he was definitely wrestling with, with something Yeah. throughout from that time he left to the time that the vehicle crashed there's and possibly for years on. leading up to this yeah I mean, he sounds yeah. like he'd been struggling for a long time possibly um i wanted to bring up the idea of bryce having left on purpose and kind of pre-planning this uh in, in order to join some type of group or off-grid cult because there are a lot we talked about this a lot last night that could be a possibility you know with him sitting there could he have been waiting for someone was there a certain place to meet? 
to go meet up with a group that can conceal your identity. Yeah. There's been a lot of talk about that um, in Mara Murray's case. We talked a lot with James Renner about his thinking, and he really thinks that she could be out there and part of some group or cult that's living off grid and away from society. Absolutely. I mean, there's way more out there than you would even imagine. I mean, there's so much that we just don't know, and there's so much that we do know where like we covered the love is one cult where people literally leave their life, their yeah. families and everything behind to go and, you know, either go on a spiritual journey where they feel like they're mm -hmm. going to go, you know, they got to get away from society and go sort of reset themselves mm -hmm. or they, you know, they find some type of group online. But my, my biggest reason for that not being likely is because the police did end up getting his phone, his laptop, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they searched it. When maybe, he find that right. Thing, yeah. Maybe they did find that stuff and they might know that he's That's true. voluntarily at, with something yeah. or out somewhere he with somebody. He's every right totally. to do that. Well, I was just thinking too, I'm like, when he's sitting there in Buttonwillow in the car, just chilling, I almost wonder that because his parents called Chris, you know, called the uh, repair shop and had Christian come and check on him. I almost wonder if he wasn't planning to crash the vehicle at all and that maybe he was either waiting to meet somebody or he was going to abandon the vehicle just on the side of the road like that and potentially by having his mom and this guy following him and checking up on him that it sort of triggered triggered in a, a response where he was just got extremely angry and he's like you know what i'm just gonna i'm just gonna totally make them think that i i died or that i you know, I crashed all their stuff and left all the stuff behind. I wonder if that was a part of the original plan to go up right. into Lake Castaic and dr and have the vehicle go off the side of of that that roadway. I just am like, mm -hmm. it almost seems it's like why. And he was clearly sitting there thinking about something for a long time. Right. So it probably wasn't part of the original plan, or else he would have enacted it very quickly. Right. Why, why wouldn't you just go straight to, to Lake? There? And then it's going to make you exhausted, especially if you're going to try to go crash his car and then leave. Why would you? you know, delay that so much to where you're completely exhausted by the point you're going to have to do that. Yeah, but like, why was he driving around multiple times? They see him on uh, this, his yep, car on camera looping. multiple times. Like what, what probably looking what for a good doing? spot, probably, probably looking, looking for, for a good spot, spot to drive yeah, off. That would make sense. He was probably scouting the area, trying to figure out, okay, where's going to be the mm. best spot that I can send this car over and it, it gets completely destroyed or they think something happened to me here. And then I'm going to leave this area and go so that they're stuck searching this area and meanwhile i'm completely somewhere else like how this could is, you walk off a scene after going through that that's I, what we're saying i like, personally like, don't I think he don't was in the it. car i don't think he was in the vehicle i think this was a complete setup i mean the two drops of blood or whatever i mean there's minimal blood there's not yeah. a ton of evidence to suggest that he was in the vehicle and you know what when we watched the disappeared episode we watched it again all these years later and hearing the sheriff they sent to be or the investigator that was reporting on what they believe it was just so obvious that they have no fucking idea yeah you know or they didn't at that point when this was recorded in 2016 maybe there was some i mean for them to change it it sounded like they were very sure this was suicidal and they were talking a lot about mental health meant you know his mental state and then now it switched to voluntarily missing. So clearly something has changed in the time since the disappeared episode. I agree with that Reddit user. They must have encountered him because you don't just declare someone voluntarily missing for no reason. The family would be in, enraged. So they must they must know. There, something. There's something that they're not telling us clearly. Mm -hmm. And I just think the the you know taking your own life theory in this situation is is very unlikely just based on the search that was conducted after. I mean, if you're going to, what, you survive the crash, get out, and then, what, go walk into the water, and then I know. what? Like, yeah, it's, it's like a very how, risky and odd way to do it. I mean, there's Unless no he had some way to do textbook, it. Textbook, obviously. But, yeah, exactly. There's That's a, that's a lot of work. There's or if a he lot had help. Simpler ways to do it. Yeah, or he had help. But then I'm like, if he left on his own and went to go join some other group or cult, whatever the hell... I could imagine that most of those groups would be like, it's a requirement to leave. Your, yes. When you're leaving, you leave everything behind. Yes, you're leaving there your is whole no family. identification. There mm -hmm. is no yes, laptop, phone, over. wallet, nothing. You yes. leave it all. Yep. And, you know, any type of cult group will do that. Or we did talk about the idea of a secret, uh, you know, secret program. People do 
leave to join secret programs. They'll leave their whole lives behind and mm-hmm. dedicate their lives to some mission. Um, I don't know. With all of his other stuff going on, I kind of I doubt that idea now. I, the more I just I, know. I just feel like if that were the case, he probably would have done this differently. I mean, yeah. it'd be way easier ways to do this. I feel like than the way that he did. And why why would you wait somewhere and risk risk being seen? You know, like if you're going to disappear into some seat why wouldn't you just go drive immediately to the middle why sit at a rest stop yeah. for hours yeah. well you know why do all these things that's a good point. leading up to the disappearance versus just why not go straight from your ex's apartment and go straight into the hill somewhere and just disappear like i mean there's so yeah. many ways to disappear yeah. especially in this area that why do it in this manner and why with this sort of I don't know. Breakdown of it. And that's the thing with this case is there's just endless questions and no answers. So just to wrap up, since he's disappeared, there have been no verified sightings of Bryce. If Bryce is still alive out there, that he doesn't know who he is. I mean, I, you know, I, because I truly don't believe that Bryce is willingly not contacting me. It's been three years of a nightmare. Bryce is described as five foot 11, 170 pounds. He has red hair and blue eyes, a muscular build, and has both ears pierced. He also has several tattoos. He's got a tattoo of a Taurus bullhead and a Roman, a Roman numeral on his left shoulder. The tattoos also includes a scripted letter K for his mom, Karen, and a scripted letter M for his dad, Mike. He was last seen wearing white cargo shorts, a blue and white checkered shirt, and white and red Nike shoes. His data has been registered with the National Missing Persons Database and his fingerprints, dental records, and DNA are all on record. Bryce's parents say they've never given up on searching for him and they will always continue to try to figure out what happened. In November of 2019, a picture circulated online that claimed that Bryce was found. The image was trending on Facebook for a while and his family eventually had to clarify that it wasn't true and they don't know who ca- who created the image or why. Every time a body is found that could be Bryce, Mike and Karen have to contact local detectives to find out if it's their son. I'm sure that's just exhausting. If they could tell Bryce anything, they want him to know that they have never been angry with him and no matter what happened, he's not in any trouble. They want him to know they love him very much, and they just want to know that he's okay. They continue to update on their Facebook page, Find Bryce Las Pisa, regularly. Please, if you are interested in, you know, following the case and supporting their family, go ahead and give them a follow. And this is pretty cool. To help spread awareness, they started distributing random acts of kindness cards with Bryce's picture and information on them. And they also post a printout version so that people can use it. So if you're interested, you can go check it out and print your own. On the anniversary of his disappearance, they post the image and ask people to do something nice for a stranger in honor of Bryce. The family continues to hope that Bryce will be found alive one day. We keep hope alive. We have heard stories of people that have been missing for years and that are found. And that's always our hope that we keep our faith that Bryce will be found. Of course, if any of you have information about Bryce's case, or his disappearance, you should contact 949-292-4400 or email at findbrycelostpizza at gmail.com. And there's currently a $5,000 reward for any information that leads to finding Bryce. The one thing that I did want to say sort of wrapping this up is that no matter what happens, you know, with the family, and again, we don't know exactly what what was going on there mm-hmm. you know we talked about a lot of these things that were are all pure speculation i mean when you look at pictures of him with his family i mean looks like a very happy family yeah but it's and hard it's hard it's to hard, really know right, right? it's hard to know but i'm just saying that from the parents mm-hmm. perspective here they're heartbroken i mean they're in pain regardless of whatever happened or you know whatever we don't know it's got to be incredibly difficult to go day by day not knowing where your child is especially yeah knowing that they might be alive somewhere and they're mm-hmm. just Choosing you just have no idea where you. where they are yeah not wanting to contact or unable you. to contact you oh every every possible scenario is just so stressful to think about i believe they said in the disappeared episode that it would almost be easier if they knew that he was deceased because yeah. then, then there's closure she then did you know, say that you know that she said not knowing is even worse and, and i totally and I, get that i do too i couldn't even imagine because 
at the end of the day, they just want to know that he's alive and well. I don't think they're necessarily wanting him to come back home or mm -hmm. maybe even necessarily contact them. But well, I wonder if when you know police updated it to voluntarily missing, if they told them anything, if they've updated them on why they did that, or if they've. I don't even know if we know. Yeah, that's the thing is I everything's I, been very tight lipped with this case. Yeah, I haven't even been, I tried to track down like where exactly that pinpointed from, but it's really hard to find. It's mm -hmm. just kind of a thing that's out there, but yeah, that that's the biggest question is do they know more based on that or what do the police have to provide them when that status sort of changes? Mm -hmm. Like, do they know any, or they just literally tell them that he's now listed as voluntarily missing and that's all that they have. I mean, either way, that's that's really tough to deal with. But we obviously want to know what you think about this case. What theory makes the most sense to you? Let us know in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can always tweet your thoughts to us mm -hmm. at Mile Higher Pod. And we're also on Instagram as well at Mile Higher Pod. But yeah, it's, this is just one of those that you could go on and on about and, yeah. and trying to theorize what might have happened because there's just so many different scenarios that could play out with this one. So let us know. Make sure you're subscribed to us as well. We really appreciate it. Ratings and reviews yes. also help. And we will catch you guys next week with another episode of the Mile Higher Podcast. But until next time, keep on taking your mind a mile higher.